because uh, Russia at this time is kind of a mysterious and dangerous place given all of the noise from uh, the U.S. foreign policy establishment, NATO, et cetera? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to uh, lie. It was um, the the concept of traveling to Russia, um, you know, it was interesting to contemplate. Um, uh, first of all, um, I honestly thought that my government would stop me, that uh, they would prevent me from getting on the airplane. Um, and so I was pleasantly shocked when uh, when I was allowed to board and um, and we were flying from Istanbul to Novosibirsk, which was our initial port of entry. Um, not too many Americans, not too many foreigners come into Novosibirsk as their initial point of entry. Uh, most people come in through, you know, Moscow, maybe St. Petersburg, maybe Sochi. Uh, Novosibirsk is sort of deep into the hinterlands of uh, of Siberia, but that was the home city of my host, uh, the uh, uh, Alexander Zirionov, the uh, the man who was my sponsor. Um, and so that's where we flew. And uh, that was interesting in its own right. I think uh, the um, the Russian um, customs and border guard people who uh, who do passport control uh, were shocked to see American passports slid across the, uh, the, 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 the you know, their window to them. Um, in fact, they were so shocked. They said, time out, go sit down. We got to refer this to higher headquarters. And uh, they sorted out. We had the right visas and uh, uh, the authorities knew that we were coming. And so we were eventually put in. But uh, it just goes to show that the strangeness aspect was a two way street um, because not too many Americans travel to uh, Russia at this point in, in time. Um, the purpose of the visit, as you said, was to um, promote the Russian edition of my book. It was published by uh, Komsomolskaya Pravda, uh, one of the largest and most respected publishing houses uh, in Russia. Um, and they did a fantastic job in getting this book uh, to print. Um, they, uh, I think they printed 15,000 copies uh, to start with. And uh, from my understanding is uh, they all sold that quick. So um, yay for that. Um, and, you know, look, Komsomolskaya Pravda's uh, motivation in, um, you know, helping support this tour was to sell books. And so that, of course, played an important part of, you know, what I did. But the mechanism of, of, of selling the book consisted of doing uh, shows like this, uh, to go on to Russian shows and talk about disarmament, talk about the book, talk about current affairs. Um in each city I went, I uh, I did a um, sort of a town hall type uh, meeting. Um, they were originally supposed to be quite large, and there was a lot of interest. I, I'm I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that uh, there's a lot of interest in Russia for what I have to say. And had the opportunity been permitted to go forward, uh, we could have easily have filled um, the venues with um, you know a thousand, five thousand people. Um, the decision, however. Uh, was made from a security perspective to not do that. Um, shortly before I was supposed to arrive in Russia, um, a Russian um, war blogger named uh, nicknamed Tatarsky was uh, assassinated by uh, Ukrainian intelligence. And um, he is on a death list known as the Mirtvorets list. Um, I'm on that list. And um, the Ukrainian government has um, heightened my profile in terms of their condemnation of what I've been saying about of the conflict in Ukraine. And so there was concern that um, if they advertised venues well in advance, that this could become a target for um, people who wish to do me harm, but more importantly, uh, forget me, um, hurt innocent people who were coming to, to hear what I had to say. I mean, you don't want to uh, create the conditions where hundreds, uh, thousands of people's lives could be in, put at risk. And so one of the things that happened is that the um, announcement of the um, of my talks was um, withheld until the last moment, and there was extremely tight security around it. So um, I didn't get to address the massive crowds, but the crowds that I did address were people who wanted to be there, uh, people who were interested uh, in what I had to say, people who challenged me so some very interesting questions, very poignant questions on you know questions on the market, and so I, I had this wonderful opportunity to interact. With the people but the other part of the journey um was my own journey to learn more about russia you see because this isn't just about promoting a book i mean that's 
course, the, what made this this trip possible. But to give this trip meaning, uh, did, you know, beyond simply marketing, um, I, I felt that it was imperative that I go to Russia, see firsthand what's what Russia is about, and try and do my best to capture the essence of Russia and bring it back to America, so that I could better explain to Americans who haven't had the opportunity to go to Russia, uh, the reality of Russia. Um, you know, some people might think it's corny, but the way I describe what I'm trying to capture this essence is the Russian soul. Uh, it's a concept that, um, you know, I didn't invent, um, you know, Russian, uh, writers have been talking about the Russian soul for centuries now, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Lermontov, they all speak about the Russian soul in one way or another. And the Russians themselves speak about the soul. Uh, it's an important part of who they are, what they are. Uh, and here I am an American and I'm trying to go, well, what is the Russian soul? How would you describe it? What does it encompass? Um, and what, what's the meaning of it? And what does it, you know, what, what's the ramifications of this Russian soul? Um, and that was a journey I went on and I took it seriously. I, um, I had unique opportunities to see Russian culture, uh, Russian history, um, and in, in the Russian people, the Russian nature. Um, part of my trip was what I call the planes, trains, and automobile aspect of it, meaning that we did a lot of flying. Um, we took a lot of trains and we drove a lot. Uh, so I got to see every aspect of Russians, you know, Russian transport. Um, the report card that I'll put back on Russia is the following. And this may shock a lot of Americans. Um, sanctions aren't working. In fact, let me just put it the other way. The sanctions are making Russia stronger. Um, the Russian economy today is the strongest economy in the history of the Russian Federation. That's not Scott Ritter saying. I mean, that was my observation. But, um, you know, Russia just held something called the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. Um, and Vladimir Putin spoke there and gave a report card, which he said the exact same thing. The Russian economy is doing A-OK. -okay. It's growing. It's the strongest, most vibrant, most dynamic economy in the history of Russia. And it's the, the reason for this is because of Russia's uh, compelled response to the sanctions that the United States and Europe have, um, have put in place. Russia has beat the sanctions. Uh, Russia is moving on. They don't care about the West anymore. They don't need the West anymore. They don't want the West anymore. And they're thriving. Um, every city, you know, in, I come from the United States. You're here, Danny. Uh, you know, you heard about the Build Back Better plan, you know, Joe Biden's big infrastructure plan and uh, what it was going to do, the miracles that it was going to perform in America. You know, new bridges, new roads, new everything. We were going to make, we're going to redo America. Um, big home improvement project. Well, it hasn't happened. Um, and it's not going to happen because we can't afford it. Um, let me tell you who's doing Build Back Better, the Russians. Every city I went to, there are massive construction projects. Why? Because thanks to sanctions, the uh, oligarch-driven system of uh, developing the Russian economy, where you would make business opportunities, make money, and then have that money leave Russia, is over. No, no money's fleeing Russia right now because we're, Russia's been sanctioned. Uh, they can't take their money out. So, but they're still making money. Where's it going? It's being reinvested back into Russia. And this means that city planners who used to have tight budgets, just like any American city planner, go talk to anybody, whether it's a small town like where I come from, Bethlehem, New York, or the city of Albany, state capital, but still a small city, or go to New York City. Every city planning session has the following problem. Too many hands reaching out saying, I need money, I have projects I want to do, not enough money. You, there's not enough money to go around. Well, in Russia, that's not the problem. Problem is, they got money and they don't have enough people to do the projects. They are literally calling people up and saying, hey, I know you didn't bid on this, but you guys mind coming down? We have about you know 300 million rubles we need to spend on, on something. And uh, we'd like you to come in and tell us what you think you can do. Um, and that's happening right now. Foreign investment, um, domestic investment, there's just construction taking place. Now, if people think that I'm trying to paint a picture of a utopia, I'm not. Um, Russia, like any country, has its problems. First of all, Russia is still digging itself out of the hole that was built, uh, dug by Boris Yeltsin 
and the collective West in the 1990s. There are ramifications of that disastrous period uh, that, that resonate to this day. <clears throat> One of the problems also is that, um, you know, Russia, like any, any large country, um, has bureaucracies, uh, and some bureaucracies are more efficient than others. Um, and some bureaucracies, especially when you have your deal with, you know, energy based income and things of that nature, there is a level of corruption. So let's not pretend that there is no corruption in Russia, that everything is perfect, that everybody operates perfectly. There are many problems in Russia. Let's just be straight up about that. And the Russians will tell you the same thing. Yeah, we got problems. But Russia's working. They're trying to solve the problems that they do have. They have solved many of the problems that did exist, and Russia is functioning. Russia is moving forward. Um, you know, they, they they have some friction holding them back, but they're going to overcome those problems. And thanks to sanctions, we've made it easier for Russia to begin to overcome those uh, problems. The other thing too is because of this war, um, patriotism is <laughs> taking hold in Russia. Um, you know, Russians have always been patriotic. There's always been, the, you know, this this love of Mother Russia. But the, the I would say that, you know, while people supported Putin um, and he had majority support, I can't say that there was overwhelming enthusiasm for Putin. It was more like, all right, yeah, Vladimir Putin is doing an OK job. Um, we're not unhappy that he's there. The majority of Russians, a lot of Russians saying, we don't like the guy. Uh, we, we'd like to see someone else. Um, because of this war, what's happening is the people that didn't like Vladimir Putin, they left. <laughs> and the Russians are like, bon voyage, good riddance. <laughs> we don't need you. We don't want you. Have a good day. And the Russians that remain are focused on defending Russia. And you defend Russia any number of ways. It's not just about going to the front lines. It's about serving Russia at home and serving Russia efficiently. And so a lot of the problems that existed, bureaucratic inertia, um, corruption, um, are being self-solved by people who suddenly woke up and went, you know what? I'm done with being corrupt for the time being. I'm actually going to run a clean business, first of all, because the government's insisting I do. Uh, but second of all, because I want to, because I want to be efficient, because my inefficiency is hurting Russia in the face of uh, this collective threat. So... The more these sanctions go on, the more we prolong the conflict. And, you know, the conflict is prolonged every time Congress allocates billions of dollars to the Ukrainian government to keep the, their, their, their system function, to keep their military in the field. The stronger Russia gets. Russia today is stronger economically. Russia is stronger politically. Uh, Russia is stronger militarily. This war has not weakened Russia. Russia's military has expanded from 900,000 to 1.5 million. It's probably bigger than that because of a very large volunteer contingent that's fighting in the um, special military operation. Russian defense industry is churning along you know, at, at full speed, all cylinders going without detrimentally impacting their civilian industry. This isn't as though Russia you know, hit the switch and went straight over to you know, World War II type military only production. They have a vibrant uh, civilian um, you know, uh, economy, they're building cars, they're building everything, and they're building a lot of weapons, and they're doing it very efficiently, better than the collective West does. Russia is stronger today than it has ever been, and it's getting stronger. Um, now, that's, I guess, from the perspective of the West, that's bad news, because we ain't going to win. We're not going to beat them. Now, let me give you the good news. The Russians don't hate us. The Russians actually want to be our friends. The Russians are desperate to find a solution. And when I say desperate, I don't mean pathetic desperation. What I'm saying is the desperation of good people, good people who want good things to happen for everybody. They don't wish the American people harm. Uh, they wish the American people prosperity. And they desire friendship with the American people if the American people are serious about it. The day of the Russians bending over backwards to appease the West is over. Uh, Russia's moving on. But what the Russians are saying is, hey, if you want to come in and join us, we're happy to have you. Uh, we'll be your friends. We, we don't have. And, and this is the amazing thing for all the stuff that we've done against them, all the harm we've caused. Because I have to tell you, as an American, if a nation, we saw it here, Danny, we know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. After 
are you telling me there were no hard feelings in the American public towards Muslims, towards Muslim nations? I mean, you saw how we went off and started holding to account people who had nothing to do with the attack. Hell, we went to war against Iraq that had nothing to do with 9-11 um, because we hold grudges. Uh, we're prejudiced. Uh, we're ignorant. Um, and the Muslims that we turned our ire against hadn't done anything to us, but we still turned on them. Here's the Russian with the United States of America saying we seek the strategic defeat of Russia. That means the end of Russia as we know it. Um, we are engaged in supplying a Ukrainian government that is problematic in every sense of the word. Uh, Banderas supporting neo-Nazi leaning, um, non-democratic um, government. And we're providing them with weapons that kill Russians. You know, Vladimir Putin uh, in his uh, presentation at the uh, St. Petersburg uh, International Economic Forum, spoke of a casualty ratio right now in this current counteroffensive, which I'm sure we'll talk about soon, of 10 to 1. That is, for every 10 dead Ukrainians, there's one dead Russian. And on, on, on the one hand, you're sitting there going, wow, that's a massacre. But think about it. Um, a figure I heard today from a very responsible source is that the Ukrainians have suffered 13,000 dead so far. That's 1,300 Russian dead. 1,300 Russian dead. That's a lot of widows. That's a lot of moms burying their sons. That's a lot of sons and daughters missing their fathers. That's a lot of families whose lives are forever ruined by this conflict. And while I can't speak for those individuals, what I can say as a nation is that when, if, if this was us and we were burying 1,300 Americans because of actions taken by the Russian government, supported by the Russian people, There'd be a lot of hatred here in America towards Russia. We'd have reason to hate them. Um, there's no hatred in Russia. None. I didn't experience any hatred. There's some dislike. <laughs> People are strongly disliking. But they dislike the policy. They dislike the government. But the feeling towards the American people is surprisingly benevolent, uh, surprisingly warm. Um, and that's the good news is no matter what we've done, no matter the sins that we have committed collectively against Russia, and we have committed many sins, um, the Russian people are, there's enough heart in there to forgive what we've done and to be willing to work with us to move forward. And that's the only hope we have right now, is that the Russian people will find it in their hearts when this war is over and this war will end and we will not win. They will. They will not be the kind of victor America is, um, a vindictive victor. Um, you know, we, we hold people to account. We, uh, the Russians aren't going to be that. The Russians are going to be a good neighbor, um, a, a, a good citizen, a good global citizen. And that's the one redeeming um, feature of this entire disaster that's taking place is that there is an off-ramp. There is hope for the future, but it's only because of the quality of the Russian people and frankly speaking, the maturity of the Russian government. This is what I saw when I went to Russia. Incredible. Incredible to hear that. You know, I, I was in Europe for three weeks. I happened to be in Brussels and, you know, the land of the EU, so to speak. And, and it was just, see, you can see the decline. I mean, you can see it in your pocketbook real quick because everywhere you go, I was in Germany as well. The, the prices are ridiculous. You can see the infrastructure crumbling, even these like wonderful trains, which, you know, we live in the United States. So uh, there, there's very little of the kind of trains you even see in Europe. But even their train, they're breaking down, they're stopping, they're, say, they're throwing people off the trains, telling you, oh, sorry, you're not going to get to your location, figure it out. There's no workers because they're cutting everything back. And I'm wondering, Scott, before we get into the conflict itself, what does Russia think about? What's going on? I mean, what did what did what did people you spoke to in Russia think about what's happening in the U.S. and Europe? Because it seems like, as you said, Russia is rising, it's growing, it's strengthening. And on the other hand, those very countries, the NATO countries, the EU, the United States that are waging this proxy war, they are suffering pretty dire consequences. It's quite obvious. I, I mean, the prices in Germany just out of this world. I was in Prague and Czech Republic. The price is no one can live there. I don't know how anyone lives there, given the wages and how inflation has decimated. And then you see Ukraine flags everywhere, 
everywhere. It was just maddening. Every everywhere you go, Ukraine flag. All the biz businesses are changing their like brands and their signs to put the Ukraine. It was it was it was really sickening to see. But uh, I'm wondering what what did people you spoke to think about what's happening in the U.S. and Europe? Well, let me let me start by saying this: um, the United States has imposed together with Europe, uh, massive sanctions on Russia. And the purpose of that was deliberately to bring harm to the Russian people, to bring about economic collapse, to cause people to lose their jobs, their livelihood, to cause Russian infrastructure to crumble, to cause problems. And had that happened, uh, Americans would be high-fiving themselves. Oh, yeah, man, we did it. <laughs> we made the ruble rubble, baby. We brought down the Russian. High five. Let's get a beer. Hey, America's great. We made the Russians feel pain. Aren't we good people? Um, so now, you know, the Russians didn't start off to bring pain to Europe or to the United States. It's never been their objective. But because of the sanctions boomeranging back on Europe and the United States, there are problems. And I will I will tell you this. Um, not every Russian. I mean, all Russians are upset about this. They're not happy about this. They, I mean, some of them are, are like, well, you brought it on yourselves. You know, we didn't want this, but you brought it on yourselves. We're sorry this is happening to you. Um, some Russians cry. They feel bad about this. Not, not They don't feel guilty about it. But these are these are people that are so damn human, so damn human, that when they hear about what's happened, um, they get emotional. Uh, they they feel pain. They have empathy. They have sympathy. Um, these are just damn good people. Damn good people. Um, there's no Russian doing a jig, uh, gloating over the fact that uh, the Germans are paying high energy prices, that German workers are losing their jobs, that Americans are getting punished at the pump, et cetera. I didn't meet a single Russian who was like, oh, yeah, baby, <laughs> the Americans are feeling the pain. We're happy. None of that. I'm not saying that doesn't exist. I'm sure somewhere in Russia, there's people that dance a jig when they hear that America feels pain. And yeah, to be honest, I can't blame them. But every Russian I met, maybe because they were meeting an American and they didn't want to display maybe their true. But I always felt that they're very open. The one thing I'll tell you about the Russians is they're an open damn book. Now, that book will stay closed for the longest time because they're a little reticent and all that stuff. But when they decide to sit down and get to know you, that book comes open. And they're they're like flipping through all the pages. This is who I am. This is who we are. So the Russians that I dealt with, they came down and they opened up the book and people cried about what's what's happening here. They were sorry. They were emotional. They didn't want it to happen. They don't want it to happen. Um, this is just the God's honest truth. Uh, the Russians are not gloating over pain being brought. And one of the reasons why is that the Russians know pain. You see, in America, now, you and I know we have we have people that know pain. Look at the army of homeless that exists in this country. Look at everybody who's living paycheck to paycheck. I was trying to explain to the Russians. I said, you know, you guys think that I'm an American and I'm, I'm wealthy and I can show you a photograph of my house and you see two cars in the, in, the, in the driveway and you're like, wow, you're doing good. And I'm like, wow, I'm not doing good. I am two missed paychecks away from losing everything, everything. The bank will take my house, the, 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 the bank will take my cars because I'm paying car payments. I'm paying the house. I'm in debt up to here, as every American is. And I am two missed paychecks away, sometimes only one missed paycheck away from losing everything. Um, this is stressful being an American. You know, health insurance. You know, if you're lucky enough to have an employer that provides it, uh, it's literally the premiums are doubling every year. It's, and you're and you're in and what you're getting for this doubling is less. They reduce the benefits, they double the premiums. But imagine somebody who bought into Obamacare. You can't afford Obamacare because Obamacare requires you to have five to ten thousand dollars in the bank to pay the you know if you get hospitalized to 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 make that payment because that's the otherwise you couldn't afford the payment for Obamacare to get the platinum program. Can't afford it. Most people end up buying minimum level, which means that they have deductibles that they can't afford if they actually get sick. That's the reality of America. Student debt up the yin-yang, um, all debt up the yin-yang. Um, you know, and so people are under the perception that, you know, everything's easy here. It ain't easy here. It's hard in America. It's hard to be an American uh, to sustain what we what we have. But the, um, you know, the, the, the Russians, when they learn about this, they're shocked. They're shocked. They're like, wait a minute. <laughs> 
what about all this prosperity? I said, you know, it, it it's artificial. We're in a consumer society where we fake ourselves out by continuing to buy. But most of the time when we continue to buy, we accrue more debt. So that puts more pressure on us. And then to feel better about it, we have to go out and buy that next Xbox or I guess it's called an Xbox still, a PS5. Is it a PS5? I don't know because I don't do it, but my daughter does. So, you know, it's got to keep up with the Joneses. Uh, you got to get the new, you know, iPhone, whatever. Um, you know, but again, to get it, you go more in debt, which means that that paycheck issue becomes a bigger paycheck issue. I'm not saying the Russians don't have economic difficulties. They do, but they don't live under the constant fear of losing their home, uh, losing their jobs, losing health care, um, being unable to go to school, because that's not how Russia works. Russia's it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good place to live. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to go live there because I'm an American. I belong here in America. My job is to fix my country. Uh, I love my country. Um, but I'm honest enough to say that um, the quality of life in Russia is, is, is decent. It's getting better. Um, and the, it, you know, it, it goes beyond simple um, consumer driven things. See, Americans tend to judge quality of life by what we own, what we've acquired. Russians judge quality of life by like quality of life, meaning can I go out with my friends? Uh, can I take a vacation? Uh, can I just stroll the streets and look at, you know, go through a park without worrying about being mugged, uh, go to a museum and enjoy the history? That's quality of life for the Russians. Um, and most Americans don't have that because we're working long hours. We come home, um, you know, we eat, uh, we go to bed, we get up, we go back, we work long hours. That's our life. So the quality is what we can get, what we can buy uh, based upon that labor to give us, you know, cheap thrills or whatever. But we don't take the time to actually stop and smell the roses, as that old country, you know, country and Western song went. Um, the Russians do. The Russians smell the roses every single day.